over the course of her career, a working woman with a college degree will earn on average hundreds of thousands of dollars less than a man who does the same work. So to anyone who says 77 cents on the dollar sounds pretty close to equal, I say, uh, your math is bad. <laughs> you wouldn't like it if your vote only counted in three out of four elections. <laughs> you wouldn't like it if your daughters uh, or sons went to school, uh, but they only got taught three out of four, day, uh, four days a week, or, or, or four out of five days a week. You wouldn't like it if, if you were forced to work every fourth day without pay. Men would be complaining about that. <laughs> they wouldn't think that was equal or fair. So this is the 21st century. It's time to close that gap. If women are working, doing the same work for, for less money, why aren't companies full of women? Why aren't employers going out actively seeking women? Well, they don't, and they don't for some of the same reasons that, um, that you know, women take different sorts of roles and different part-time roles. Women don't work as long hours as men do, even if they don't have children. They take longer holidays. They don't make as much money for their firms. They don't work the same overtime. Um, so we can't really expect them to be compensated the same as men when they don't work as hard. Now, that's not, uh, you know, I don't, mean, I don't mean that to sound, uh, you know, I'm kind about women. Women simply have different um, priorities in life. For most women want a more balanced life. They want time with their family. They want to do, to do hobbies. They want more time away on holiday. They don't want to put in the, the work that those sort of obsessive, aggressive, um, you know, uh, or, uh, sort of goal-oriented male professions sometimes demand, the law, for example. Um, women just aren't really interested in devoting their whole life to work in that way. Um, and the, the very broad brush figures from the ONS simply reflect that. What they don't show is that a woman going to the workplace is going to be paid less than a man for the same. In fact, under the age of 35 in the UK, and the US, women are paid more in the same sorts of roles, and they're two to one more likely to get jobs in science and maths because employers are so desperate to hire women. Well, one of the things they told me was that um, he, well, we were, he was at the house one night, and uh, we, were talk, we were talking, and he started laughing. He said, Aaron, what do you think women's liberation was about? And uh, I said, I, I'm pretty conventional thinking about it at that point. I said, I think it's about women having the right to work, getting equal pay with men, just like they won the right to vote, you know? And he started to laugh. He said, you're an idiot. And I said, why am I an idiot? He said, you want, let me tell you what that was about. We, the Rockefellers, funded that. We funded women's lib, you know? And we're the ones who got all over the newspapers and television, the Rockefeller Foundation. He says, and you want to know why? He said, there were two primary reasons. And they were, one reason was, we couldn't tax half the population before women's live. And the second reason was, now we get the kids in school at an early age. We can indoctrinate the kids how to think. It breaks up their family. The, the kids start looking at the state as the family, as the school, as the officials, as their family, not as the parents teaching them. And so those are the two prim the primary reasons for women's live, which, which I thought up to that point was a noble thing. You know, when I saw their intentions behind it, where they were coming from when they created it, the thought of it, I saw, I saw the evil behind what I thought was a noble adventure. You know? Aaron, did you know that Gloria Steinem, in one of her own books, now admits the CIA funded Miss Magazine? No, I had no idea about that. No, I never heard that. Yeah, we're gonna CIA funded Miss Magazine? Funded Miss Magazine with the stated goal of taxing women and breaking up the family. No kidding. I never heard that. Well, Nick told me. I mean, I mean, I know it, but not because I know the CIA was involved in it. Well, she, Gloria Steinem was proud of it. Oh, the CIA wanted to help me help women. No and, kidding. And so they funded it. Yeah, and, and of course it's divide and conquer. Right. And, of and course. what they do is they focus in obviously on real problems. Women were getting shafted in many ways, but the elite didn't wasn't planning to help them. They were planning to really shaft them and take men away from them. Look at what they did with black families. You only had about ten percent of legitimacy fifty years ago. Uh, in black communities, and now it's over 90%. And look at welfare. You were going to give me some money, but you can't have a man in the house. Right. And, and so that was further to degrade the family, yeah. totally destroyed, uh, and, and, and now illegitimacy is over 50% in the general population. Right. Well, see, the whole thing is, is these people control the money, so they make all the rules. It's, it's kind of not fair to measure most women by the standard of most men because they're going to get more activists as they grow older. And, and when you're young, you're thinking, you know, where are the boys? The boys are with Bernie or, you know. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> now, if I said that. <laughs> no. 
No, no. Yeah, they're for say. Bernie because that's where the boys. No, are. no. You'd, but you'd, you'd, you'd but it's swap not me. Come no, on. No, I wouldn't. I okay. wouldn't because Good. because the boys are saying whether. No, I mean, hello. What do you? How well do you know me? Okay. <laughs> <Right>. Okay. <laughs> not that well. Uh, I was trying to get onto this fucking website here. I got it here. There's a uh, some. This is something people wanted me to talk about. And if you want me to go off on something. Just uh, tweet at me with hashtag T-A-M-M-P, Thursday afternoon, Monday morning podcast, just before Friday. Um, it says, feminist upset over statue of a man and a woman talking. Um, scene. Okay, here's the scene. All right, this is in Washington, D.C. You're a woman sitting on a bench reading a book. Your male friend sees you on the quad and comes over to say hello and talk. You put down your book, lean back against the bench, and smile. He doesn't sit next to you. Instead, he puts his foot on the bench and leans over on his knee. Uh, so sexist, right? Uh, that scene is depicted in a statue at the University of Incarnate World in San Antonio, Texas. And despite no sign of distress or physical assertion, some women have decided it is a statue. Oh, my God. This is of mansplaining a term used to describe men condescendingly explaining something to a woman. <laughs> Dude, how much do they fucking hate us? Like, they never do that? Jesus Christ, every five seconds they're trying to fix you and change how you are. Why don't they see the balance in that? That's fucking nuts to me. Anyway, seriously, here's the actual statue and the claim of uh, misog misogyny. Um, okay, some, some woman wrote, a friend spotted this in Texas, hashtag mansplaining the statue. Oh my God, I have to start explaining shit to women. If this fucking annoys them, all you got to do is just do it more. Uh, the tweet went viral over Memorial Day weekend. It all started when Ash Hernandez saw the statue on her way to a teacher's uh, certification test. She was so outraged that she ran back to her car to get her phone to snap a picture. Uh, the sculpture just screamed mansplaining. Let me just fucking try to be open and honest, which is really difficult for me because I'm such a cunt. But when I look at this thing, um, I don't see her smiling. She actually looks like her lips are pursed, like she's going, really? But he, he's he seems like a nice guy. He's got a nice full head of hair. He's wearing a pair of slacks. He's got his shirt tucked in. He, he does seem like she, she seems annoyed by him. I will say that. The way she's looking up at him. How the fuck do we make this a little bigger? But I mean, if I saw this, I would be like, this guy's striking out. She's not having it. I don't know. I don't know what the deal is. He definitely, I got to admit, he definitely does look like he interrupted her. You know, she's got her legs crossed. She's got the book there she was reading, and he came over. I don't think this is mansplaining. I think the guy's kind of a douchebag, and he's taking a fucking, you know, he's taking a swing. Um, I think feminists have to understand that uh, in order for us to get laid, we have to initiate the, uh, the interaction. So, uh, you know, maybe he didn't have to put his loafer up on the bench. But I don't think that's a reason to take the whole fucking thing down. Like, I wouldn't walk by that statue as a guy and be like, you know what? I'm going to do that. Next time I see a lady reading a book, I'm going to put my fucking foot on there. Mansplaining's hilarious. Just for the record, ladies, they do it to us, too. There's always that fucking person. You know that person? It's, it's usually a, a person who's... Uh, Either they're not educated or they're overly impressed with their education. Like someone who didn't go to college is always trying to constantly uh, uh, throw out some information about something that they're well read on, that they read, you know, to overcompensate for the fact that they didn't fucking throw a hundred grand into the goddamn toilet going to going away to school. Um, or you get those people that, um, you know, I went to undergrad here and then I matriculated over to fucking blah 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 for my graduate and my baccalaureate degree. You know, those fucking people. And you know, I'm not saying that that they can't be cool. And I'm not saying someone that doesn't go to a fucking college never didn't go didn't go to college can't be fucking cool. But I'm just saying generally fucking speaking, um those are the two types of people. They over explain shit. You know? I mean I've, I've, maybe you don't have 
experienced this, but I've picked up a sort of profound loneliness, particularly in the generation of, of say, 17 to 27, of men that seem totally alienated and lost. They see no decent role models in culture. They see no um, nothing particularly to aspire to or hope for. Get watching women kind of accelerate past them thanks to, you know, social engineering, effectively, and the lies of, you know, feminists and well-meaning journalists and idiot politicians. And they've seen their place, kind of, you know, the, the, their purpose in life and their, their raison d'etre sort of gradually dragged out from under them. Some of them are attracted to the kind of heroic Nietzschean, you know, independence and heroism that, that, you know, that, that you're talking about, but many of them just sort of feel hopelessly lost. Have you, have you experienced that? And what's your advice to men like that? Because we're not just oh, talking about, we're not just talking about, um, you know, you'll say something like this, trying to be sort of sensitive and compassionate and real. And feminists, you know, in, the, in their infinite and boundless sociopathy will come back and say, you know, lonely basement dwelling neckbeards who gives a, who gives a toss, you know, um, uh, who cares, good riddance. You know, if, if, you, if you talk, for instance, about men kind of running away from the institution of marriage, they'll be like, well, fine, who cares? Um, these sort of nasty sociopathic lesbianic feminists will do this from time to time. But I care. And I think we should all care about uh, men who feel this way. And by the way, it isn't just your stereotypical, you know, marginalised autistic young guy. There are handsome, athletic, successful, smart men who are similarly just so completely alienated and, and bewildered and lost. And I think it's. I think maybe maybe you have a different view on this, but it seems to me sort of seventeen to twenty-five is kind of the sweet spot for this. And some of these young men just feel so hopelessly lost. Um, it can be difficult to know what to do for them. If you, if you, you've, you've encountered that too, I guess. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the saddest stories in the world. I mean, you have the, the age that everybody has all this great potential. And the doors are kind of closed for them. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things that feminism did was that it says men aren't supposed to have a role. I mean, the idea is the eradication of gender roles. That, and uh, so, you know, that sense of purpose that comes with having a role is gone. Uh, in terms of, you know, as far as running away from traditional marriage, they, they know that marriage is kind of a trap for them in many cases. Uh, you know, they could fall in love with a woman or whatever, but, uh, you know, they know that she can make a phone call and, and, and end, end everything. And, uh, you know, she can end everything, have their ki- her kids taken away. Everything that he sacrifices for, a woman can erase in a heartbeat. And they know that. They're not stupid. A lot of them have already seen their fathers get divorced and go through all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, as far as, you know, as, you know, in t- terms of jobs, I mean, there aren't a lot of jobs that aren't just mindless phone answering and email answering and so forth. And, uh, you know, a lot of the jobs that gave men a sense of purpose, having some kind of skill that made them valuable, uh, those jobs are in many cases very difficult to get unless you, uh, you know, are part of, in America, unless you're, you know, your parents are in a union or already and you can kind of get grandfathered in. But, uh, you know, and, and those jobs are being sent overseas. So instead, they're being left with these kind of, um, you know, managerial class jobs, which in many ways women are better at. Uh, you know, yeah, because they tend to be about kind of, negotiation and communication and coordination. Absolutely. Which are absolutely. Not, things, not things that men take as much joy in, in doing. Yeah, yeah, they're just their their skills. You know, they have these natural skills that just aren't getting used, and so you know the the only things that they're available to them are things that they are not as good at as women. Whereas the things that they are better at than women, those roles are gone, and so yeah, of course they're hopeless. You know, and so all they have to do is to kind of retreat into like kind of porn and video games and all that kind of stuff, and uh, where they get to play out those roles that they're not allowed to take in real life. Yeah, it, it certainly seems true. To what extent do you think that's a product of economic factors, and to what extent is it um, is it social? I mean, certainly much of it feels like it's driven by feminism, but some of it also, of course, is just technology. Uh, you know, it's just technology. It's been being you know, it's, it's it's the world turning into software. It is that middle. You know, the, those sort of doctor lawyer professions being disintermediated by software. I mean, who's to blame for this? Really, is it Silicon Valley, or is it feminists, or is it sort of fifty fifty? It's both. I mean, it's not. I mean, technology has been undermining men's roles for you know a couple hundred years, if not since the beginning of time. Really, you know, every time they invent something that is more efficient, ten guys lose their job or whatever. And feminism couldn't exist without that technology. I mean, feminism absolutely relies on you know freely available birth control. Feminism yeah. doesn't exist without that. And uh, you know, which I'd love to say is feminist because it, it makes their heads explode. But you know, men don't have anywhere really where to go 
uh, and, and in terms of jobs and economic things, it's one hand washes the other. I mean, obviously, who's in charge of hiring them? Well, the female, probably feminist human resources person. You know, they are the feminism and the corporate life are actually intermixed, which is funny because if you hear, you know, the far, far left talk, you'd think that they, they are they're incompatible. But I think that the corporations and feminism are kind of walking hand in hand now. That's very interesting. I think you're probably right about that. First of all, we should talk about what happened at the triggering, which was a talk that I did with Christina Hoff Summers and Stephen Crowder at UMass Amherst. And it gave birth to perhaps the most extraordinary creation of the internet since Big Red. Do you know what Big Red is? Are you old enough to know what that is? Have you, are you around on the internet for Big Red? So, number one, number one, shut the fuck up for a second. Feminists do not want you to lose custody of your children. The assumption that women are naturally better caregivers is part of patriarchy. Yeah, so she's this Canadian woman who's yelling in the street about, um, or she's reading this sort of like, 10 point definition of the patriarchy or something. Feminists do not like commercials in which bumbling dads mess up the laundry and competent wives have to bustle in and fix it. The assumption that women were working on it and you guys are trying to, to dismantle it. But if you fucking listen. The oppression, systematic oppression of women is an example of patriarchy. I'm talking. <laughs> 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 I'm reading fucking face with a camera. I'm trying to fucking, I'm letting everybody else hear it, okay? It was amazing. Because she was like, she was sort of like the the perfect example of what an insane, uh, you know, red-haired, angry-looking, lesbianic, overweight, over-angry feminist is supposed to look like. This is a list okay. of the things that we're working towards. Now, if you would shut the fuck up for the 50th billion time, these are things that we agree on. These are things that we're agreeing on. But I've got a feeling that she might be about to lose her crown to Jigglypuff. So Triglypuff is the name given to this wonderful student who, by now, I'm sure every listener of this show will have seen the footage of her throwing her arms up and down. Do you know what's amazing about it? And I've said this a couple of times before, so sorry for those listeners who've heard this already, but there's an order of events to that video, which I find fascinating. So she starts by taking an enormous intake of breath. Like her body knows that there's no way she'll get through this much <laughs> exercise without, you know, a massive injection of oxygen. She has this huge intake. And then she hurls her arms up into the air and yells, get your hate speech off this campus three times whilst thrusting her arms backwards and forwards. And just, you know, it's what in less politically correct times we'd refer to as spurging out. Um, just losing it. And then it's like she's been switched off. Suddenly she just stops. The arms come back down. I don't know if you... Those terrible Star Wars movies, you know, the, the Attack of the Clones, yeah. the drone, whatever it is. You know when they turn all the robots off and they all just go... Yeah. You know? <laughs> the clone army gets switched off. You know, it's like, it's have, like, you, have you seen the one where it's her doing it and it's her energy level decreases as she heads <laughs> towards the... Have you seen that one online? Yeah, you know what they did? It's like a Street Fighter thing, so... She's got this like bar of rage and it gets used up as she, <laughs> as she's going through this incredible protest like you've never heard, you've never seen in your life. Stop talking to us like children! And then eventually she's just, yeah, just... <laughs> it's the funniest thing, and I love it, and it's absolutely great. But she has friends. She has friends that presumably feel sorry for her and who are very supportive of her body positivity. This is what we have to call fat people who aren't ashamed of it. Fat people who aren't sorry about, you know, about the fact that they're gigantic, quivering mounds of flesh, unlovable ham beasts. Um, we now have to say that they're body positive. 
which is a sort of horrible sociopathic system of lying. It's like an anti-health cult. It's something that, that social justice warriors and feminists do to vulnerable young girls, telling them that they can be, they can look how they want and behave how they want and they'll still be happy and somebody will still love them, which is, of course, a lie. It is a sociopathic lie that we tell these young people, condemning them to a life of misery and solitude. Anyway, so she's one of these and she's got friends. And one of these friends, finally getting around to the news bit of this, one of these friends demanded that a student journalist should be punished for daring to film a protester at a public event. I mean, these people show up. This is the essence of the cry bully. This is the essence of the social justice warrior who is at once aggressor and victim. What I used to call um, quantum superstate feminism. She shows up to cause a fuss at a public event in a room where there are 500 smartphones. And then they cry foul when one of them embarrasses themselves. It's absolutely amazing. Again, back to my concerns about the internet and, mm -hmm. and uh, Twitter and all that kind of stuff. Um, I have this uh, – we kind of touched on this once and I, I, I can't get it out of my craw. What these uh, watchdog groups on the internet, which are usually left to center – and I, again, I'm not passing judgment about that. It's just usually where they are um, – what they're doing to the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. I mean, people are scared shitless to say anything for fear that these someone will attack them and tell their employer or affect their employ or get like I was. I was. Um, my mm -hmm. daughter's a big fan of Jenna Marbles. Do you know who she is? Who? Yeah, it's an internet sensation. These guys know. They know. Look at the look at those pusses. Yeah, she's a does a download does a video thing you know every week, and she did a thing this week on uh, sluts. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it was very tame and very actually kind of thoughtful. Mm -hmm. And the feminist groups mobilized. Mm -hmm. de must destroy her. Sure. Not, not, hey, we got some issues here. Have you ever thought about? No, no. She must be taken down. She mm -hmm. has to be off the internet. She needs to be destroyed. Her livelihood, gone. Sorry. Right. Yeah. What, where's the First Amendment right in that? You can't, if you stand up and say something, you're, you're going to lose your ability to make a living? Well, that's there's, okay? There's a couple of things. The group that says you cannot judge does nothing but judge what, what they should always put the caveat and say you can't judge and then write a group of ethnicities that you can't judge. You can judge white people. You can you can judge. You can't judge women. But if a woman is a Republican, you can tear her apart. You can't judge a black person. But if the black person is on the right side of the aisle, then he's fair game. He's Clarence Thomas. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You cannot judge unless they're either Republicans or in, in a in a group that we, d d you know, if he's heterosexual, you can judge. If he's homosexual, you can't judge. But if he's homosexual and Republican, then you can judge. So they have this whole you can't judge, but there's really a fucking long scroll of people. And all they do, by the way, is judge. But I don't, I don't mind the judge. all they do is bully. Well, that's, they what, I, cyber that's, that's bully. what I hate. And they come out and they talk about this cyber, this bullying's got to end and cyber bullying's got to end. And this poor gay they kid. they bully the fuck? Out jumped of these off a bridge yeah. because he was cyber bullied by his roommate, and then they bully the fuck out of everyone who doesn't agree with them. It's not just, I mean, it's more than bully. It's like it feels violent. Right. Like, like, My, bullying, like calling somebody an asshole is one thing, but get them, get them off, make them so they can't yeah. talk anymore. Right. And what, what we need to do, it's not their fault, they're them. What does that mean? They're who they are, they're who they're going to be. Yeah. They're miserable, powerless fucks. Well, they're not powerless. Who, who want to, well, who have banded together, mm -hmm. created a little power, and decided to use that power to sort of lord it over people that are probably more successful than them. It's our fault for not telling them to fuck off, that we need to stand up and, first off, whether you agree or disagree with what the person's message was, you have to agree with the right to deliver right. the message. That's the part that I that I can't stand. But the message is even getting – tell Lynch, Max Pat, uh I recently – I was talking about this on a podcast, but I recently got put on just you know this list of dumbest people you know of 2012. And – Again, it's one of these things where if I had nerve endings, maybe it would bother me. I'm one of the dumbest people of 2012. I mean, that that's no. that doesn't feel good. No. Does anyone want to be on the list? No. I don't think about it. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. And by the way, you think I'm dumb? Look around, baby. Look around. 
let me invite you to my mansion and show you my collections of Lamborghinis. And then when we stand up in my super garage, we'll look over all the shitty places I used to live and all the shitty places I used to work and all the fucked out apartments I used to <laughs> sleep on the floor of. And then you tell me how dumb I am. But, or we can check the New York Times bestseller list and see how dumb I am. But still doesn't stop them from putting me on a list of the right. dumbest people of 2012. Now, they're not going to do it if... I actually had a learning disability right. and was semi-retarded. They probably wouldn't put me on this list of dumbest people. But if you scroll down, you can see uh, I'm under. Chris. Petraeus I'm, is on the dumbest people. I'm under Chris Brown. Well, Petraeus is not a. Well, dumb there's always man. there's always people on the list that you you're glad to be on the list with. Yeah. Uh, I'm under Chris Brown. Oh, who yeah. Made his fist into a ball and punched it into a woman's face. Yeah. He's there for punching out. Women, uh, I'm in there for saying women aren't funny, except for in terms of dumb, you should do your research. That's not what you said. I didn't say that. Yeah. But because people are so anxious to bully in the cyber world, so anxious to make something out of nothing, so anxious to tear somebody down, then they do it. Now, for me, it's just one more time my name is being put out there, more traffic, more uh, – more people checking out my website, more people buying Mangria. And I don't give a shit. But what if I did? Like, what if I was really sensitive? You know, what or, if I or, just or killed if, myself? Or, and went, or like, what if your employer went, hey, we can't have any of this on our business? Yeah, you're too dumb. No, yeah. we, do, we just can't have this kind of bad press on our business. It'll affect right. our, our business. Right. we got to get rid of you. Mm -hmm. that, that that's okay? Happen. No, that's not okay. But let me tell you how dumb I am. I don't have an employer. I, I know, I know. That's but, how but dumb I am. Do, and these I have a don't. whole bunch of fucking lack. Uh, um, represent a employees, employees. No, no. Team members, team members <laughs> who are in the facility that daddy did not give me, that Barack Obama did not build me, that I fucking bought. And then I built a studio and now I have a pirate ship and I don't have a boss. So everyone can lick my salty balls because I get to say whatever the fuck I want. And that's why I did what I do. And I get plenty of shit on the Internet. And listen, all you groups out there, you miserable groups, go sick, baby. Go sick. Take your best shot. Do whatever the fuck you want. Because guess what? I don't give a fuck. I don't work for GE or CBS. I don't have uh, but, anybody but, over and, me who can let Adam, me what, go. I, I get you are free and clear, but what bothers me is the other people that they don't feel care. entitled. Come on. <laughs> they feel entitled to go after that, yes. that can have their livelihood or their families assaulted by this or their relationships fucked up by this. I know. You know what I mean? We're living in an era of angry nerds. And, and angry envious, nerds. Envy, envy. Envious, angry nerds who it used to be they wouldn't pop off because they'd get punched in the face. And now there's no punching in the face because they're thousands of miles away. They're under a uh, pseudonym and they're on the internet. So go sick, angry nerds. And uh, all I'm saying is, is it's up to people like you and people like me and other people in the media to tell these people to fuck off. They, they, no one will do that because everyone's afraid of their uh, don't, advertisers. Don't, 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 don't blah, blah, blah. do, don't react. Advertisers don't react. I know, but you can't get that to happen. They're yes, you can. Shitless. Oh. We already have. I have sponsors. They write fucking shitty letters to me, and they write horrible things about me being a misogynist and this, that, and the other. And you know, uh, I'm, I'm homophobic. Um, 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 a xenophobic. I'm a misogynistic. I hate gays. I hate women. I hate everybody. I hate the gay and lesbian community. I hate everyone. I have plenty of sponsors. My sponsors have told them in essence, to fuck off. What are, they, what are they basing all this hatred on? I mean, what are they, what are they basing your hatred on, I guess, is the question. I make jokes. Yeah. I make jokes about Chaz Bono. So I hate gays and lesbians. As you know, you've been around me. You've seen all the bashing. Like whenever we go to the, you know, when we used to do colleges, where I'd go like, where's the closest gay bar? And they'd be like, uh, let's uh, down on a corner that's on uh, Fifth and Bleecker. And I'd go, all right, hold on. And then I'd grab the fire extinguisher, take the lid off, piss in it, and then get my buddies. I'd get my pickup truck, and I'd go down there and spray them with my urine. 
I don't know, take a pool cue sometimes if they didn't have the fire extinguisher and go down there and bust the place up. Oh, you mean That's every, what we used to every do. Every college, yeah, of course. Every time we traveled. Every time. You saw all the confrontations I had with gay people yeah. all the time we yeah. threw down and all, all the bashing and beating I'd do of them. And, and then the verbal lashing you also The gave verbal them. attacks. You uh-huh. gave them, yes, yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, gays. Yeah. Uh, women. Uh, people of all ethnicities. You, you know, what's interesting. That's what I did. What's interesting, whatever. What's interesting is I do it about all ethnicities. Well, uh, not, no, no, you do it everybody. Everybody. Your wife, me, we all get it. Everyone gets it. Yeah. Right. right. Oh, but only a certain amount of them complain. <laughs> and it's usually the ones that aren't doing as well. Interesting. Maybe I should start complaining. I'm, I'm going to take to the internet. I'm going to fuck you up. Go ahead. That's going to happen. Okay, so we have to ask. Girls is it, perform better at You have to ask if this is really a problem. More women are going to university. They're getting higher grades at school. They're getting higher grades at university. Twenty percent of all more women graduate. Women. women in their thirties earn more than men for the same work in their thirties in the UK and the US. Now they are two to one more likely to get a job with the same qualifications. Where's the structural bias against women here? I don't see the problem here. What I do see actually is a very reasonable complaint from a lot of young men, not my generation, maybe. You know, I'm sort of ten years older than them, but from a lot of young men who are going to university, going into the workplace, and they don't recognise the world you're describing. But this is, this is based on an assumption that there ought to be some kind of gender parity. My suggestion is that there isn't. We don't complain when women dominate subjects like nursing. We shouldn't complain when men dominate subjects like physics. <laughs> For our lesbian friends, or any men in the audience, or as I like to call them, eunuchs, you might like to consider scissor fingers, which is a fairly simple one. Um, you have to kind of lift it up in the air to really get the full effect, but basically you just sort of lean back a little bit and just do this. Finally, a perennial feminist favourite, something you won't even have to teach your audience. It's finger wagging. I think it's pretty clear, unfortunately, that this is, it comes down to an issue of personal responsibility. No cloud service is ever going to be completely secure. Apple does have a responsibility to make its so- software as secure as possible, but there will always be hackers who are much smarter and much cleverer um, and are much more determined to exploit vulnerabilities. What this boils down to, for celebrities just like everybody else, is personal responsibility. And if you're going to take pictures of yourself like that, by far the most intelligent thing to do is do it with a Polaroid. Don't do it on a device that's connected to the Internet, that's sending your pictures to servers you don't control. It's a, recipe for, it's a recipe for madness. And for somebody who is as rich and as famous as Jennifer Lawrence is, um, you know, it's, it's sort of unbelievable. It's really weird, isn't it? I mean, um, we keep hearing about all of these extraordinary hate crimes that, that happen everywhere, but it doesn't really, I don't think, uh, reflect the Britain that most of us know and love. The, the problem really, I think, is that um, there's a whole ecosystem of publicly funded uh, think tanks and university um, de- you know, departments and, and all the rest of it, all, all set up to find prejudice somewhere um, to justify their own existence. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't reflect the country that, um, that I know, and I don't think it reflects most people's experiences of being gay. Well, I grew up in a very small village in Kent, um, and I can tell you that actually, you know, people who live in the country, who grow up in, you know, in r- rural places in England are some of the most tolerant, some of the most welcoming, some of the loveliest people in the country. In fact, it's in the city that I have personally experienced more, uh, I guess, uh, oppression or victimisation, because I don't think they really exist in Britain anymore, but certainly where I've experienced the most problem for being gay, and ironically, it's not really for being gay at all. It was much more difficult to come out as a, as a Tory voter being gay than it was, you know, my sexuality in the first place, and that was a result of a sort of gay establishment, which is now using very much the same sort of, uh, um, you know, tactics that they, they say that they were uh, subjected to themselves over decades. I don't think it really reflects um, Britain. And I think, you know, it's easy to get caught up in the hysteria and drama about, uh, you know, homophobia. It's not really a problem anymore in this country, in the same way that it's patronising and out of date to say that women are some sort of oppressed minority or oppressed underclass in this country. It simply isn't true anymore. Well, I lived in a small community and I was noticeably different. I remain noticeably different. The problem with hate crimes, first of all, is they're far too broadly defined. Second of all, it's a sort of Orwellian attempt to get inside the minds of of people involved in altercations and work out what their real motivations were. Um, And thirdly, in fact, it sort of destroys the concept of equality before the law because effectively what hate crime means is it's more of a crime to hit let's say me, then it would be to hit you, which is something that I think most of your viewers would probably disagree with the principle of. Um, You know, it's an absurd thing to try to get into the minds of people, work out what they were really motivated by and what they were really doing. And this is the problem we're seeing at the moment in the US with the the shooter, this terrible um, uh, atrocity in Charleston. Um, People trying to get into his his mind and work out what what he was really motivated by. The fact is we'll never know, it was crazy. Um, Lots of people get into fights all the time, but if you provide people with this ready-made victimhood 
good script. Um, they're quite willing. They, they will be quite willing to use it. And unfortunately, gay people do get into fights, and when they get into fights, they you know have a habit of crying foul and crying homophobia in the same way that um, unfortunately lots of of um, other kinds of minorities have sort of been trained into doing as well because they know it gets results. Like every sort of rightsist movement in its death throes, the um, discussion gets ever more hysterical and focused on ever smaller things. So if you look at sort of the gender war, you look at modern feminism, they start to focus on ever more tiny things, but ever more hysterically. So we see, for example, obsession over transgender pronouns um, to the point of hysteria and mania, to the point of, of pursuing people if they don't use them properly. We see, you know, um, discussion about man spreading, which is this, this thing in New York, apparently men sit with their legs too wide on the tube. And it's spoken about with enormous, extraordinary sort of ferocity and hatred, like this was something that actually mattered. I mean, never mind the women who put their handbags and shopping on the seats. You know, this sort of weird, obscure, tiny um, stuff that is spoken about enormously ang angrily is the sign of a movement in its death throes, panicking okay. because it's worried about perpetuating its own existence. Suzanne, let me, let me ask you, you um, in the book, you, you uh, write out what you believe the three tenets of feminism are. Um, you cite them as, number one, feminists are imprisoned by their negative view of women and their place in the world around them. Number two, all of the injustices perpetuated on women through the centuries. The most oppressive on women is that women must have babies and men do not. Uh, sorry, that's the, the, the third. And the third one, there's no difference between males and females other than their sex organs. That's what you say um, feminists believe today and have, have tried to, you know, convince mm -hmm. other Americans believing. Walker. But mm -hmm. Suzanne Vanker, I mean, in your words, what is the, what do you see is the problem with feminism? Why do you well, call it the worst thing ever to happen to American women? Yeah, and I, and I use that example because that is a, a, a such a important story, and it's not just her story. It's so many people's story. And what we're really left with when it comes to feminism is not just that issue that she's referring to with um, a struggle, a struggle having children late in, later in life, but also this notion that women today owe feminists for everything. Now, you might have noticed when this article was published in BU Today a week ago, and there were so many comments, mm -hmm. uh, negative comments, of course, from, from people on campus. Um, the overwhelming theme in those comments was that was something to the effect of, how do Suzanne and Phyllis, for that matter, think they are able to get published in the first place? Or how, do you, how is it that they can disparage a movement that is what allowed them to get college degrees and become authors? Now, that was very telling because that is exact, exactly the message that young people are getting about feminism, that, that we as women today owe feminists for those things. But in fact, we do not. And if we did, I mean, if that were the case, then how is it that my grandmother in 1920 had a college degree? How is it that my mother, who's now 80, has a master's degree and went into the male-dominated uh, field of, uh, uh, she was a stockbroker, um, way before, or not way before, but during the 50s, before mm -hmm. the 60s movement got off the ground. I mean, Making them think that they need to live their lives in a certain way. And why is that? Why do you think that it's so all pervasive through American society? There is a chasm in America, essentially, between the powerful and the um, not so powerful. I'll, I'll, I'll call them everyday Americans. We know from the research that everyday Americans are largely a right of center bunch. We also know that those in the media are largely not a right of center bunch. And because of that, the views on um, all areas of our lives, whether it's education, sex, um, work, motherhood, you name it, all those important aspects of life are getting filtered through a left-wing lens. Well, except that there's and a lot of very powerful, I mean, Rush Limbaugh has huge numbers of listeners that, you know, put, uh, I'll even admit Rush it, our, our, our own listeners, you know, our own listener numbers in, mm -hmm. uh, I in a shadow. So there's, I think you're, you're, you're identifying parts of the media here. Well, what I'm referring to specifically, what we call the feminist elite. And the feminist elite are they reside in three primary three areas academia as evidenced by the responses from the article at Boston University last week mm -hmm. and in Hollywood and in the media and most people especially young people are exposed on a routine basis to these women first in college then in um, the media via television magazines 
and in Hollywood. So the messages that they're getting are consistently coming from this one place. And that message conflicts with what they, what will, I believe, will lead them to um, a happy place and will um, uh, go along with the value systems that the value system that they have for themselves. And they need a voice. Mm. And that's really where Flipside comes in. You know, I got several emails as a result of that um, article at BU from students at BU who said women, who said young girls, who said that, who thanked me profusely because they feel like they have nowhere to go. That's what I'm all about. I am for those people who don't have a voice. And, you know, what was interesting to me uh, in the book is that, you know, you, you spend quite a bit of time um, really you know, going after, for example, Gloria Steinem, uh, Betty Friedan, uh, the biggest names in what's popularly known as uh, second wave feminism. And mm-hmm. a lot of your arguments um, against them, uh, to be honest, they sort of struck me as um, you, you going after an antiquated notion of feminism, like one that's sort of frozen in amber from the 60s and 70s, and that maybe a lot of women, uh, and maybe it's not very many anymore, but those women who think about feminism today don't actually subscribe to those same notions from, you know, the 60s and 70s, and you're, you're attacking something that doesn't really exist anymore. Well, can you give me an example of what you mean? Well, w- you know, when you say that, um, uh, there's, I have a quote here, you say that, for if I wasn't a feminist, well, you're describing what people um, who are f- feminists today think. You say, for if I wasn't a feminist downgrading the role of wife and mother and planning an exciting career to liberate me from the home, well, then I must be conservative. And it was this, you know, when you say, it seems like you're saying that people, feminists still think that liberation means being free from men, free from the home, and, um, you know, free from the shackles that society has put on them. And I wonder is if more women today don't see it as liberation, but just as a part, a natural part of the totality of what they want to experience in their lives. Um, well, that would, that would be fine, because I would, exper- I would um, define that the same way myself, totality of what I want to experience. There's a lot of things I want to do in my life. And I explain in the book that women, uh, it's a very positive book, book, that women can have it all if they sequence their lives. But if that were true, that it wasn't Um, If what you said was true, then why is it that women in college, many women in college, who aspire to have marriage and motherhood at the center of their lives, feel that they cannot say that out loud Mm -hmm. without being attacked or maybe not attacked but looked at funny? It is not PC to talk about getting married and having babies when you're in college. That is a fact. And the, the reality of that does stem from something, and it stems from feminism because feminism at its outset in the 1960s was about demeaning motherhood. Now, we can go back and forth on this all day long, but it's in the book very clearly how it all began and all the research and the um, backup for that research is there. So it's it's sort of like it's snowballed. That's kind of what I'm getting at, mm-hmm. that anything that starts there is going to eventually, you know, you say something often enough over and over and over again, and it just becomes part of the culture. And uh, there's so many people that today, they don't think of themselves as feminists. They don't even use that term. Um, but they, their lives have been a direct result of the feminist culture and, their, and the influence of feminism on their life, often without even knowing it. Um, you know, feminism absolutely means different things to different people. And one of the things that we talk about on Flipside is that today flip, uh, feminism is dis- discussed in, in three parts, essentially. First wave, second wave, and third wave. The first wave being the suffragette movement of the 19th century, then the second wave being the Betty Friedan 1960s period, and then the third wave being today. Um, I think the most outspoken feminist today is Jessica Valenti, and she has a um, organization or website called Feministing, and they represent the third wave feminists. And she gave an, she gave the definition, of a working definition for feminism just several months ago in the Washington Post. So when I go to the definition for feminism, I go right to the source, to the feminist. I mean, they should know what, what their own organization well, yeah, one or movement source. is. So, uh, well, one source, but it's the current. That, that, certainly that represents third wave, and that goes hand in hand with second wave. Uh, however, it does not go hand in hand with first wave. So there is no real comparison between the suffragette movement and the feminist movement in the 1960s. The feminists in the 1960s just piggybacked off of that earlier movement that virtually every sane person would agree with in terms of the right to vote. And 
and called that women's rights and said that they were continuing forth with that uh, initial uh, movement. But in fact, the early uh, feminists, if you want to call them that, the suffragettes, were not pro-choice and were very family-oriented women. So those two agendas are very different. Yeah, my, the uh, distinction there is wonderful. I think that focusing on oppression um, for women um, in third world countries or worldwide is a fantastic place for feminists to focus their attention. Hillary Clinton right now has uh, taken on um, an assignment uh, for that very thing. And I think that the uh, focus should be over there as opposed to here because the, the problem is comparing American women to um, women in other countries and suggesting that we are uh, all sort of equally oppressed and that's kind of, um, you know, that there's still more work to be done here as though we are not fully um, finished with the movement when I'm saying essentially we are. Fake focus on the on the real uh, oppression. That's great. And then I read in the end of your book, um, you know, here are what you call are the non-negotiables in terms of the solutions to the problem mm-hmm. that you see. So one, casual sex is a dead-end street. Two, marriage is the ultimate goal and divorce should not be assumed to be an option. And three, children need, deserve, and want to be raised by their own parents. Experience. I agree. I agree. And I think that flip side does that. Um, I think that it absolutely, uh, while you you call it black and white, but those three non-negotiables in the end aren't designed to be viewed as black and white. They're designed to give um, assistance, really, help in planning your life in a way that that will ultimately bring you, or I should say, allow you to have it all in a way that the the current message that you get from the culture doesn't allow. And so I'm saying essentially, you know, ignore the culture and the way they're telling you to do things. If you do it this way, you have a better chance to get what you want, which... Very liberal. I'm getting my master's degree. And when I, I say I'm getting my master's degree and I have someone, you know, that I'm in love with and I want to marry oh, I hope you don't do that before you finish your master's degree. You can put your kids, you can put having kids, you know, later in life. And I feel guilty, I have to admit, saying that I would think about becoming engaged or having kids or getting married and putting off getting my master's degree because people look at me weird. Mm. They think, why would you ever do that? Why wouldn't you get your schooling and your career underway? Well, I'm going to be 35 or 40 by the time I get settled into my career. It's shared by a lot, the sort of conflict that people feel. Suzanne, we've just got a couple minutes left, to, and I, I want to ask you one last question uh, okay. about uh, you know how uh, what Americans are feeling, American women um, in, in this day and age, because you, you write very eloquently in the book about s- sexual promiscuity and the, and the problems mm-hmm. and the pressures that young women feel there. But you also write that there is growing pushback uh, that, you know, a lot of young women are saying, no, I don't want to be sexually promiscuous. What are you still so afraid of from feminism? (laughs) Oh, um, I'm not afraid of feminism. I'm pointing out what's going on. And people want that and need that information so that they can begin to think differently about their lives. The fact that women want to be married or Americans still want to be married is a great thing. The problem is we have an issue with marriage in this country. And the and so there's a gap between what they're saying they want to do and the messages that they get from the culture. There's a strong feminist presence on campus. There's a strong Black Lives Matter presence on campus.
Does anyone here believe that women are paid less than men for the same work? Put your hand up. Okay. <laughs> Everyone who puts their hands up, you're idiots. culture of rape that means that American university campuses have higher rates of sexual assault than the Congo. More than one in five women have sexual assault on campus. Does anybody believe that about American campuses? Anybody? No? Fewer idiots on that one. Well, that's something. These claims, based on advocacy research repeated by credulous journalists, are designed to do one thing. They're designed to push a particular political ideology on you that is divisive, hateful, bigoted, in many cases racist, in many cases sexist, and is simply really much fun. And I had fun. So I was talking to you about free speech and how free speech can be fun. <laughs> Ow! <laughs> If you're in the audience and you are aggrieved about the gender pay gap, let me make your life happier and explain to you why you're wrong. <laughs> if you take all of the money that women earn and all of the money that men earn and you do a simple sort of division, you will arrive at a figure of, let's say, 79 cents on the dollar. The problem with this is that it is babyish economics of the childish kind that only the progressive left could possibly believe in. The problem with this stuff is it doesn't take into account the different choices that women make. It doesn't take into account the fact that women tend to work shorter hours, they have babies, they do all sorts of other things that mean that um, it's not an apples for apple, it's not a, an oranges to oranges comparison. Now the problem with the wage gap is it's used to suggest that if a woman goes into the workplace, she's going to be paid 79 cents for the same work as a man. Well that confuses wages with earnings. So if you believe that there's a wage gap, I would encourage you to return to the dictionary and learn what wages mean. Because it is illegal to pay a man and a woman differently for the same work. And in fact, it doesn't happen. Now, all sorts of these sort of politically correct prescriptions surround us. There are feminists on campus who are demanding to kill all white men as though that was some sort of move toward equality. When in fact, it's simply a gesture of female chauvinism and hatred towards people that the modern intersectional far left feminist lesbianic movement doesn't like. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> well, look here. Here's the here's the deal. I like the ladies. Okay. They're, they, they they're better. They they're better at certain things. Better at most things. No. No, no, better, really. So better we've, we've been t- no, not most things. Not no, nearly, you and I argue about not this. Not nearly most they things. Use more of their brain all, more of the time. They they use more of their brain like a handicapped person uh, uses more of their wheelchair. You know, they have to try harder. They're at a no, handicap. No, 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 they are. No, no. Look here. Here's here's the deal. It, everyone always says this. Here, okay. Here's what's going on. All right. Women are great. Yeah. Women do what they do well. Yes. And uh, there's a handful of women that do what guys do well. Yep. A handful. Yeah. In general, people say, how come guys get to be the president? How come guys get to be the generals? How come guys build the skyscrapers? How come? How come? Why don't you ask yourself how come, baby? Because we're the ones who do it better. I mean, please. Now you're going to get a million people saying, oh, women are kept down. And no, wh- the how did they get kept agree. down? Who kept them down? How did who, who? Historically, they've been, but not right now. Yeah, but they're so much smarter than we are. How did we get them down? No, I'd say smarter. Well, what are they? They use more of their brain. They they do stuff we can't do. Oh, okay. well, I just have a problem yeah, like, like this. A back like, bridge. That's well, what like they Thursday do. Or whatever you were like, oh, women don't have a brain. They just have like a chip that <laughs> it's like the Xbox or whatever. What were we talking about? Uh, so I, like, I don't know. Women, look, here's the deal. Women are. Uh, I would rather hang out with a lot of women I know than a lot of guys I know. I don't have a problem with a woman being president and all that kind of stuff. I just don't like it when we try to force this everyone's exactly the same right, right, mentality right. Crap. down everyone's throat. Right. I don't want to see a Nike commercial with a bunch of chick soccer players talking about how come their endorsement deals are nothing and Michael Jordan gets everything. Well, because we want to see Michael Jordan. That That's why. Why, does a, why do female... Runway models get 50 times what a male model gets because that's what we want to see. Or that's what's this. I, I don't make the rules. This is how it goes. Uh, believe me, L. McPherson made more modeling and Cindy Crawford made more modeling than any uh, equivalent male model. Yep. Is it fair? No, it just is. Michael Jordan gets what he gets, and uh, whoever from the WNBA gets what she gets. That's how it goes. But, uh, you do find when you work with women that, uh, first off, every woman I've ever known has cried at work on at least five occasions. Shut up, Drew, and I've never known a guy who's cried at work. I was just thinking. They're if, emotional. If, if men they're, and women they're better, actually, they're better yeah, yeah. parents. They're, yes. they're not great. They're not as good in the workplace. Well, it's thinking, the wrong gene. There is an interesting thing. If men and women were exactly the same, there wouldn't be male and female leagues. Everyone would just compete in the same league. Yeah. Right? Well, and right? also... Why do we need... Do you want cats and dogs to be the same? Do you want apples and oranges to be the same? You know, you, do, do you want... Ev- really? Do we want everything to be the same? I, I sort of like the diversity part. I mean, and it's like it's like you go to dinner. You want you get some fish one night and you get some chicken the next. You, you want everything just to be fishkin? It's my new animal. <laughs> Chickish. Chickish. Yeah, it's fine. Listen, God love you ladies. Perfect. Don't Don't change. Better. Don't change. Better. Yeah, and look, you guys live longer, so what's the beef? Better. No, they're not better than guys. Guys are better at getting stuff done. They're just better it's at, at better. getting guys are stuff better. done. See, this is why... They, why Women are better at what they do. Guys are better at being a-holes, better at being aggressive. You see what I'm saying? That's no, where no, we get no. the bad... They, they, they are they, better at that. No, That's why we just, get the bad rap. No, the guys are a little more realistic than women. They mm. get the job done better mm. than women. More aggressive. No, it's not about aggression. It's just, it's just there. A woman will stop and sit down and start crying sometimes and say, "I'm not going to go on." Guys don't do that. Here's the, here's my point. Guys can rally. Chicks can't. Every guy I know has gone out, tide went on, stayed up till four thirty in the morning, and then got up at six and swung a hammer all day in the sun and has made it through the day. Woman wouldn't go into work that day. That's it. That's the gene. That's the only difference. And that's fine. They don't. They're not. They're not cut out that way. And that's a good thing. It makes them. It makes them better. At whatever it is they do. You not the only saying, difference, Drew? but that is a difference. Yes. Yes. Guys rally. Okay. There's no way your wife could do as many sub three hour sleep nights as you've done in the last five years. No possible way. And the same with my wife. It's impossible for them. All right. On the other hand. We couldn't have gotten as many massages as they've gotten and tolerated. I, I'm trying to be fair. Jesus Christ. Any massage every goddamn week? 
You don't find it ironic that you're the one who's sleeping for two and a half hours and, and hopping from plane to plane to college to college and doing all that, and they're getting their fifth massage in as many days? Yeah. How many massages did you get last year, Drew? Uh, let me cut. Say what? Say Adam, I respect your opinion and all that, but you're totally wrong. About what? what? Women. About women. Guys are much worse than girls. Much girls worse. can do everything better than guys. Everything. I wouldn't even say that. Pretty no, much. not even close. Pretty much. No. They're just, the they're only just... reason girls aren't president or any of that is because guys haven't gotten over it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Listen, <laughs> go look at the Hoover Dam. Go look at the Chrysler Building. Go look at the Chunnel. Go look at these incredible engineering feats that were not only incredible math equations, but inc it took incredible strength and incredible technology. I mean, you know, it's like the bore uh, under the English Channel for 20-something miles. I mean, I, it, it just there's no woman that has any hand in any of that. How about it's this? Just, how can't. about this? Or how about this? It's not in them. How about this? It's fine. That through history, the qualities that are uniquely superior in the male have served society well. Maybe yes. there are specific qualities in the female better at being a human being, basically. That, 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 hear me out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. That may yet for the future be more useful to what the rest of history holds for us than the male has been subsequently. Previously, rather. No. No? Now, look. Here's the thing about women. They have the kids. <laughs> That's important. It's important. <laughs> we need them to continue on. To have more males. Yes. Yeah, so I we see. Can, okay, so we good. can, we can yeah. dig more channels. Uh, yeah, okay. No, look. Women have the kids. They're the mothers. They make. Uh, they work well. They work well in uh, many uh, many capacities. But uh, they're not. They don't have as good a sense of humor as guys. They're not as smart as guys by and large, and they don't contribute as much to society as we know it. But in an unspoken way, maybe they do more. Right. That's all I'm saying. Right, I'll give them that. But there's, if you're just saying better, like you're trying to sort of quantify it, it's not even close. It's Obviously. <laughs> That's all right. Look, as a woman, you're in good shape. Talking to me specifically? <laughs> yes, Drew. Wearing the skirt in your family. No, listen, my wife has a better life than I do. <laughs> there's no doubt about that. Do you see what I'm saying? I've seen what you're saying, yes. Okay. <laughs> We're into sort of, you know, broader left-wing territory here where the Educational Maintenance Allowance, uh, maintenance allowance the EMA, i.e. bribing children to go to school, well, hang you, on, just, what you, about the as, on... you just described as a basic right, which I think most ordinary people would find ridiculous. Okay, what about racism? I mean, you know, those of us who perhaps have right of centre views but are in, under, you know, no stretch of the imagination racism in my dating history looks like, a, you know, a Benetton catalogue. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a racist person, but I, I do think that there, there is some... I, I can understand people who are concerned that sexism and racism legislation, when it gives rise to positive discrimination, affirmative action, quotas and stuff like that, unfairly discriminates against certain groups okay. of people. And I just Britain, don't accept the argument that Britain's racist. Okay, let me... Well, it's extraordinary, isn't it, to hear about, you know, the, the fact that, that there's apparently a problem with women wor 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 worrying about being too thin. That's, of course, not the problem. The, wor the problem is that everyone's getting too fat. And actually, there's no evidence, really, that any of this stuff has much of an impact. A lot of the science is very fuzzy on this. It's social science stuff rather than any, any real sort of uh, reports or anything. I mean, what... What worries me about all of this kind of stuff is the implication that um, somehow we're going to make people's lives happier or better um, by encouraging them to believe that whatever body shape they are and whatever they look like, they're beautiful and they're going to be happy. That's, evident, that's quite clearly not the case. I mean, if you look at women's, women's happiness has been going down uh, since the Second World War, actually. Every decade, but women are getting more miserable as they get told that they can be who they want and look how they like. And, and you can say... I suppose that a woman's uh, self-esteem should have nothing to do with whether or not a man's sexual preference, you know, sort of coincides with how she looks. But the fact is, women are getting more unhappy, and this sort of um, slightly irresponsible trend to sort of encourage people to eat whatever they want and do whatever they want is what's, you know, is one of the things that's fueling an obesity crisis. And that's a really serious thing. That's a real thing. That's something that's got health implications. It's got cost implications for the NHS. The problem isn't too many anorexic women. The problem is quite in the opposite direction. We're perfectly happy to have uh, aspirational role models. Uh, in our entertainment. We should have them too in our retail. There's nothing wrong with encouraging people to live healthily. I'm not sure where this sort of obsession with realism and realistic proportions has come from. I mean, you can, there, there are blogs, there are feminist blogs out there that show, you know, video game characters in more realistic proportions. They turn... Uh, 
uh, Lara Croft into this sort of dumpy, lesbianic, uh, you know, short woman in cargo pants. And nobody really wants to see that. Nobody wants, not even women. It's not an aspirational uh, uh, sort of icon that people can aspire to be like. The fact is, we, have, we do have a huge problem with people treating their own health very irresponsibly. And I personally find when, when media figures and feminists and, and activists and campaigners encourage women to worship themselves no matter what their size and what their shape, actually that just has the effect of making women unhappy. And women have been getting more unhappy decade after decade after decade since the Second World War, since this stuff started to happen. I'm not sure that's the case. I think it's quite an important part of growing up as, sort of, uh, as people start to um, you know, experiment with dangerous language, they argue with each other, they position themselves against yeah, and other people. And if you provide them with these enormous words on, main, you know, on mainstream TV news stations, because you've written in national newspapers, these awful naughty words, what's a kid going to do? Use it. I'm going to read out something you wrote about homosexuality, oh God. which is the feelings of... <laughs> The feelings of alienation and rejection it engenders are responsible for the sorts of repugnant tribal posturing you see on the streets of Soho on a Friday night as bitterly unhappy queers engage in degrading and repulsive behaviour. I stand by that. It's... Uh, OK. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 60 Minutes comes on, right? Who doesn't want to watch that show and pretend they're smart? You know? I like it. Some more, Morley Safer comes on. And you know he smells like an old person. Some old people don't smell like old people, but he looks like he smells like an old person. You know? Smells of cigars, ashtrays, you know? A couple of wars, maybe a date rape. Um, <laughs> so he's interviewing Meryl Streep. All right? The great Meryl Streep. And they're going through all her old, her old friggin' life and all the movies and all the different characters that she's played. Oh, first of all, they start they start the report off with Morley Safer just sitting there, right, smelling of fucking Ben Gay and whiskey, right? And uh, he says how you know how over in England, you know, they you know I don't know they make their their actors they they award them by calling them lords and they knight them, but over here in America, all we do is just give them this shiny statue, and it's just like. Starts off right off the bat, for some reason, just shitting on America. In Britain, they honored their distinguished actors with royal titles. Lord Olivier, Dame Helen Mirren. The best we can do is nominate them for Oscars, an annual hyped-up competition for a glossy little statue. If we did have a royal list, the name of Meryl Streep would surely be at the very top. Like an Oscar is somehow beneath... Sir uh, Anthony Michael Hall, I mean, or, or Lord, what, Lord of what? Lord of what? At least you can fucking hold our statue. You're Lord of what kingdom? That phony horse shit that you have with Prince Charles and the popper or whatever the fuck is going on over there? You know? Look, if the Rothschilds knight you over there, then that fucking means something. Then you can come become part of their yacht convoy as they go around the world, figuring out how to take over another currency, right? Then you're in with them, okay? But if you're if you're fucking you know lord of this and your your wingman is the Duke of Elton John, I mean it's, the whole thing is fucking stupid, right? So right off the bat, it's already bugging me. But I know Nia hates when I talk to the TV, right? So I you know I keep my my big fucking yap shut. And they start talking about Meryl Streep, ba, 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 going through the whole thing. And then um, the old guy there, smelling of, uh, you know, prescription meds, goes, uh, you know, whenever they talk about the roles you play, they always say, you know, you play independent-minded women, very strong women. And Meryl goes, I know, that's, yeah, that's what they say. You know, when a guy, they never say to a guy, oh, you're playing a strong-willed character, yada, yada, yada. I let that go, whatever, no biggie, I'll take that. There's one observation that gets her back up when people note that she's played a lot of strong-minded women. No one has ever asked an actor, you're playing a strong-minded man. We assume that men are strong-minded or have opinions, but a strong-minded woman is a different animal. I let that go, whatever, no biggie, I'll take that. It's probably true, what the fuck do I know? I'm not a woman, right? But then they show her after she played Margaret Thatcher and she's given a speech to a bunch of women's young girls and she's trying to inspire them. And she she takes a quote 
from Margaret Thatcher, and it was something along the lines of, if you want a bunch of people to talk around, talk, stand around talking about doing something, you know, something, uh, go, to, you, you got to talk to men. But if you want it to actually get done, you got to get a woman. And then all the chicks go, woo! Margaret Thatcher said, if you, if you want something spoken about, ask a man. If you want it done, ask a woman. <laughs> So I laugh and I'm like, yay, reverse sexism, right? Just seeing, you know, my, my whole fucking theory, how everybody is just a piece of shit. You just don't have the power to act out what the fuck you want to do. Because that, that right there, if you flip that around as a guy, I, you, if you're running for president, it's fucking over. You can't be like, let me tell you, and I'll tell you what, after I get your jobs... And after I fix this economy, okay, and I'm the man to do it, because I'll tell you right now, if you're looking for someone to stand around and talk about doing something, you get a woman. You want to get it done, you got to get a man. Here are my nuts, right here on the podium. Vote for me November 4th. Go fuck yourself, right? You did that, your presidential campaign's over. She does it. It's fucking adorable. And it's just as fucking ignorant. You know what I mean? What the fuck do you get off? Saying that we stand around and do nothing, Meryl Streep. Huh? Or quoting Margaret... Th and you too, Margaret Thatcher. Let me tell you, you bitches, something. All right? We faked a fucking lunar landing. Okay? You think that's just talking? Anybody can land on the fucking moon. That's easy. But to pretend you did it, all right? And get everybody to shut the fuck up about it. That, 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 that right there, that takes skill. So whatever. So I make that little comment. And uh, did I just go that 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 that? I sound like fucking Porky Pig. So, so I make that comment, and like you know, I've been with Nia long enough that I can tell by the side of her face when she's just thinking about like, what if I just grabbed everything I really cared about and walked out of this house right now? <laughs> she got like that fucking mad at me, you know. And I'm like, she's just like, right after the story was over, she just shut the fucking thing off, and. uh I know what happened. Next thing you know, I'm walking to 7-Eleven to get some ice cream. I, I don't even know what happened. It was all going great. You know, am I the asshole there? What, what am I? Am I supposed to just fucking sit there with my mouth hanging open with drool coming out when I watch TV? If somebody says something douchey, I, I'm not supposed to say it. Ah, whatever. Whatever. So I just finally just said, you know what? Fuck this. I take the dog out. I go around the block. What do I do? I'm calling my guy friends, right? They're all backing me up. I'm not saying who I called. I don't name names, right? And they're all laughing their ass off, and they 100% agree with me, which is all I'm looking for at this point. I just want people to say that I'm right. I don't want to learn anything from this experience. Just tell me I was right so I can be an ignorant ass again. I don't know. Why don't you guys weigh in on that? Am I a dick for saying that? Should I just let that one go? You know? Oh, you know what she said that fucking drove me up the wall? She goes, why are you... She didn't say intimidated. She used one of those words. Why are you threatened by what she said? It's like, I'm not th threatened. Ugh. I, oh, Jesus Christ. Then I take the bait. You know, it just sends me right over there. Like, threatened about what? Oh, my God, this person that I don't know who has never called me nor will ever call me who has no effect on my life. How do you get threatened by that? I'm just calling it for the bullshit that it is. Because you know what? This is what fucking drives me nuts. I can't stand when somebody tells me that their shit sandwich tastes worse than my shit sandwich. Okay? Go fuck yourself. At what point am I supposed to have empathy? As I'm sitting here eating a shit sandwich and you're telling me how much worse yours is. Yours is. You know, at the end of the fucking day. You know what I mean? Sure, mine might be on, you know, a better slice of bread, which I guess would make it taste a little bit better. But at the end of the fucking day, right? The end of the fucking day. All right, I'm going to end up in a FEMA camp with you. Okay, you think when the next fucking uh, psycho comes along, I'm going to make the cut? What the fuck do I, what, what do I bring to the world? Huh? Exactly. I'm going to be standing right next to you. So go fuck yourself this fucking woman, every time she sneezes, they give her another goddamn award. She's still bitching. Still fucking bitching. You know, it's ridiculous. I remember when I did this Oscar-nominated part. Oh, go fuck yourself with your wigs. The whole thing just, you know, 
That's what fucking pisses me off when I watch this shit. If you really want to know my perspective is from where I come from, I can't bitch about shit because everybody's like, oh, go fuck yourself. You hit the lottery, right? But I got to sit here and listen to you, bitch, even if you're fucking killing it. Even if you're killing it. You know, Yale School of Drama. And he stepped on the bull. Go fuck yourself with your goddamn yachts. All right, there you go. That, that felt good. It's probably ignorant. But whatever. No, it doesn't matter in the sense that they are equal but different. But it simply isn't true to say that there is no difference whatsoever between the aptitudes of men and women. And it is um, without question true that there are some biological differences between men and women. And we know that from our anatomy. Um, but we also know it from experiments uh, that we do on young children before they've had the opportunity to be socialized, the sorts of toys that they go for. And that holds true actually for other bits of the animal kingdom as well. Some of the reason why girls drop out um, of STEM subjects at college and uh, chess clubs is because they keep losing. And one of the reasons they keep losing is that it does seem to be the case that chess as a game plays to some of the male intellectual virtues. And when Simon Baron Cohen talks about these, he's, he, the way he describes it is um, men are good at systematizing and women are good at empathizing. And there is some reason to suppose that that may have some bio, uh, basis in biology. It's very trendy these days to say that everything is socially determined, but that's not what the science says. And it's not either what common sense says, because if it were true, these days, there would be a lot more representation of women in the sciences, in astrophysics, in philosophy, in mathematics, and in chess, but there isn't. All right, here's Shamila. We hear this a lot from scientists. You hear this a lot, in particular, from female scientists. But the fact is that there are, so, there is some reason to suppose that some, that, uh, that there, that there is an advantage to being a man in certain subjects. There's reason to suppose that gender essentialism, biological determinism, whatever you want to call it, the fact that there are male brains and female brains may indeed have some basis in science. Now, this is sort of thrown out of the window completely by by feminists and female academics who just refuse to accept that there, there's any reason whatsoever why, why there might be a gender imbalance. Two things on that. One, actually, the science is very much still out on that. And two, if you look. At at equality in society. If you look, for example, at Bangladesh versus Norway, what you notice is the number of women in science and technology subjects actually goes down as societies get more equal because women simply don't make the same choices that female academics and feminists would like them to. Women actually don't want to go into the sciences um, on the whole, and when they have every option available to them, they tend to choose not to. Yeah, I've said this a million times. Like, why are there more white firemen than Asian or black firemen? It should, and it's like, maybe white guys yeah. do m are more Gravitate. attracted to this versus nursing yeah, exactly. versus airport security. Like, I, I don't know. Can we just let's decide that there's not discriminatory hiring practices. Mm -hmm. And then once we do, there's just more white yeah. firemen. That's let, the way it is. Let the yeah. water reach its own level or more or it's it's 96 percent males. I don't know why. There, but I don't know what percentage of nursery school teachers are males. I'm not attracted to that. I wanted to be a fireman. I never wanted to be this. If my son wants to teach nursery school, that'll be fine. But I'm guessing the lion's share of young boys he plays basketball with would rather be a fireman at this point. It's a biological thing. Are mm -hmm. we cool? Mm -hmm. Are we okay? All right. We'll take a quick break. Mm. Milo Yiannopoulos Hello. is in studio. We're all... Well, at least I'm a big fan. I can't speak for everyone. And I don't know that everyone isn't a big fan. I've gotten off to a rough start. We're all huge no, fans. No, it's fine. Do you know, I wanted to do one of those things, you know, like celebrities read mean tweets. I wanted to do my own version. The problem is that everyone fucking loves me. So I'm looking at, I'm looking, no, I, I mean it, you know, I mean it nicely, but I, you know, I'm, I'm looking on the internet trying to find like, really funny trolly replies and occasionally somebody will say go take a bath with a toaster and it's like a six out of ten you know right. i like to I like to give my trolls scores i'll rank them and then i'll give them tips on how to improve because i want better haters have you blocked anybody well i try not to block people because i quite like to hit i like the crazy of the internet you know everybody else, or every other journalist i know hates their readers hates comment sections hates you know twitter all the rest of it i love it i love the drama i love the chaos i think it's fantastic so i like to read everything as as, as awful as it is and as great as it is the speaking tour is the dangerous faggot tour dangerous faggot tour which is uh continuing uh, through 2016 dates and tickets are at the website uh, that is, I'll spell it out for you, Y-I-A-N-N-O-P-O-U-L-O-S dot net is where you go. Now, you're, you, you start off, and you still are a, a technology correspondent for uh, Breitbart, but then Strictly start speaking. spinning off into some other directions. I could not be contained by yes. one vertical. <laughs> and what do you, is, 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 is the... I feel the timing is perfect for a guy like yourself because we're 
going insane. And I always say, this guy was talking about metal, but I always say grunge music was born of hair bands. We'd had mm-hmm. enough Aquanet and eyeliner mm-hmm. to last us an we had an impacted ass full of guys in spandex pants. Mm-hmm. So I we went full feels. Kurt Cobain and Soundgarden. That's where we went. The pendulum swung Yes, yeah, so and we're going so insane on campuses now that we just, we're all dying for your voice to come out and scream at us and set us straight. It's kind of you to say so. Uh, I think what's interesting about um, me sort of popping up at the moment is that I'm kind of impervious to the usual critiques from the left. Now, what they like to do when you make any kind of evidence-based argument, whether it's about uh, women in the workplace, you played a clip earlier which was about you know why there aren't more women in whatever, whether it's about the wage gap, whether it's about campus rape culture, any of these other lies the left tells to get at people. Um, their usual strategy, if you try to ask them for evidence or facts or you dispute their version of, of, of events, is to try to delegitimize you as a, as a human being rather than interrogate the argument because of course they can't because they're wrong none of the facts are on their side so they'll call you a bigot they call you a misogynist a racist a homophobe a transphobe i mean most people don't even know what these words mean uh less still guilty of the of the offenses they sort of can't get me on any of that stuff because i'm a you know sassy gay british columnist who never shuts up about black dick you can't get me on racism you can't get me on sexism you can't get me on homophobia it just doesn't stick because it's not so i don't know english true, you know? desserts what is black dick again <laughs> it's like spotted dick. Dick. Just, yeah. yeah black dick it's, it's, so it's, like a, it's a layer of chocolate uh-huh. ganache um mm-hmm. with a cream topping what and you just shove it up your ass I'm, repeatedly i'm going out to england in I'm a few this this summer show. i'm gonna ask for I'm some just, black dick i don't know how this show goes <laughs> when I'm driving from the in the cab on yeah. the way from Heathrow, I'll just sure. say, "Find me some find black, me some black dick. Take me to the nearest. Yeah, take me to, yeah mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I've got a, I've, I'm of a, of a, a lust yeah, for black it, dick. I, 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 I find it sad. <laughs> I, 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 I'm with you on this, but I, I've said it a million times. To- a million times. I find it really sad that. I have many answers uh, to many of life's vexing problems. I listen to your show. I know you write about almost everything. It's usually family and education. But Mm -hmm. I can't go on Huffington Post and explain to the nice young lady what's going on in the black community because I'm not black. Which is insane. insane. It's insane. insane. It's It's like saying your doctor can't work, only has to work on people of his own nationality or something. And by the way, am I not allowed to have an opinion on anything? Mm -hmm. Do I have to be stuck in traffic to have an opinion on traffic? Or can I do it from my house in my slippers? It's insane. Do you know, I've actually written a column about this. And my conclusion on this And it's racist. It is racist. You're absolutely right. I've written a column about this. I have decided that, in fact, these equality and diversity departments, so long as they exist, if we think they need them, they should be staffed exclusively by rich, straight, older, white men. Why? Or for the same reason that it works quite well when judges look like that. Because they're not subject to the supposed oppression under discussion, they're not biased. Who better than somebody, if you believe in the concept of privilege, which is, of course, uh, you know, fairy story. It's like a conspiracy theory dreamed up by the left to, to bash people they don't like. If you believe that there is a patriarchal, heteronormative, cis, white, uh, you know, conspiracy theory to keep oppressed minorities down, surely you want the most impartial possible judge. You want somebody who's not affected by privilege, somebody who's going to be able to take a dispassionate yes. view of the warring fact. You know, because very often these things come into contact, come into combat with one another, you know, women versus gays or Hispanics versus blacks or, or as, uh, as the sort right. of stuff. Like, you Get know, rich whitey with the mind. Monocle, somebody, who has somebody needs no skin to sift in the game. through this stuff, you know. So why not choose the most privileged people of all? So I'm out, obviously. But in you know, when when Daddy's president and when he you know elects me to to press secretary, I'm going to put your name forward for the head of um, equality and diversity in the Trump White House well, because I very firmly believe you'd be the best person for the job. The other thank you. The other spurious argument that a lot of folks on the left make when you bring up any of these facts is they pull out an example. Like, I know a single mom of 18 who actually worked her way through college and now is a su- successful mm-hmm. attorney. And it's like, yeah, OK, I, I go nuts because whenever Bill Maher starts talking about radical Islam, it's like, whoa, 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 not everybody. Not I know I, I, I went to high school with a guy who was Muslim, who's perfectly gentle. Guy. Like, yeah. yes, not everyone. Stop it. It's no way there. This is the worst way to to. Solve a problem. Well, the worst way to solve a problem is like the doctor to go, not everyone has smallpox. <laughs> and you go, yes, but a significant number yeah. of our society does. Enough and people have you know what? to make it a health risk. Right. You know, so I treated can a we, kid this morning who did not, did have, not smallpox. have smallpox. Did not have smallpox. So you can't say smallpox. And it's like, yes, we can. <laughs> and why can't we? Wait a minute. Do you have smallpox? No, I don't. Well, then you shouldn't yeah. be talking about it. <laughs> it's, a, it's an insane way to solve a problem. Well, the left has developed this view of the universe, which now, unfortunately,
unfortunately obtains in the majority of the media um, and in all universities everywhere, which is why I'm doing a college tour, uh, that is based on identity politics, that there is something um, about what you're born as that gives you special X, Y, Z. Now, it's just... I thought we were past this stuff, you know. I thought the left was down with Martin Luther King, you know, judged by the content of character, not by skin color. Um, actually, well, the thing that people don't realize is that Martin Luther King lost, Malcolm X won. Um, and now feminism has become about female supremacy and, uh, and sort, of, sort of female chauvinism and misandry. Black Lives Matter is a violent, destructive, uh, selfish black supremacy movement. And all these things are based ultimately on a philosophy from the left of identitarian politics, like what you are is what you were born, rather than as I think most – Perhaps most people on the right and most libertarians and certainly the most people that I like um, would prefer society to be, we, we would prefer society to be organized according to what you think and what you say, what you believe, the work you've done, what you've learned, your conclusions, your reason. And the reason that um, the left loves to fall back on anecdotes, as you correctly identified, is that their whole world um, is viewed through the prism of individual identity. And when you try to uh, approach them and say, well, why don't we look at the data on this? Why don't we look at what's actually happening in society? They don't want to know because they want to talk about emotions and specific instances because their whole universe is translated through this filter of um, my personal experience and like, you know, my, my lived, you know, this lived experience, you know, actually that's like runs really contrary to my like lived experience. Here's like, what I've <laughs> actually discovered in my life. Like, I don't care like about your, because you're dumb as fuck and you don't know anything. You've never learned anything. And you're, you're spouting like political positions on the basis of the fact that, you know, you didn't get a rent control apartment. Like this is the level of discourse on the left now. It's very difficult to, to break through that with facts, but that's what I'm trying to do with the tour. Here's a cool, well, first off, and facts for people who don't want to hear the facts are <laughs> tough to digest. Right. I mean, you can't do it like you're trying to get some nice goose pate. It'd be nice <laughs> if you could just ram it down their throats. But if you have someone <laughs> who's not sexualized interested <laughs> in facts, then the facts aren't going to take. Um, so That's why you, I try to offend them instead. But right. Part of the problem, Gary, you can find me having a nice conversation with a nice lady on the Huffington Post uh, talking about the school to prison pipeline. But see, the thing about facts is you're coming at a place where it's like, look, um, we would like less black people incarcerated and we would like less black people, young black men shot. So let's try to solve this problem. OK. Mm -hmm. I've talked to some people and I've crunched some numbers. It turns out when families stay intact, families, their children are much more likely to have success. And they go, well, that's your white privilege talking. And you go, no, no. Yeah, like I there's something at the numbers, intrinsic to your skin color that I, makes I, you a deadbeat dad or I, I, whatever. No, take some fucking personal responsibility. I, I, you know, families look after your children turns and, and out, life gets better for yeah, everybody. It turns out married couples are much more successful than single. Uh, turns out the children of married couples statistically much like less likely to end up in jail, much more likely to get a college degree and, so, and live out of poverty. There's a million statistics yeah. to say Saying, stay together, raise your children, have success. That's it. And, if, and by the way, it universally affects white, brown. It's, if, if any Japanese folks ever got divorced, I say it would happen to them too, but I'm not aware of that. Once the skirt of divorce reaches the far right. nation of Japan. Then when you, when you go across the color rainbow, You're absolutely it has right the same this. effect on You're, young Hispanic kids right and this. young white kids as it does on young black kids. So the, it's out. Yeah. We we know what the facts are. Now, can we simply implement that? And it's like, not so fast. <laughs> so are we really talking about a group of people that would like to solve a problem? Because no, if you want really want to solve a problem, a problem you do that. If you don't, we, we then call you a racist, sexist, homophobe, or sorry, that's me, and what have you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I think I think they like they like to call me the homophobic homosexual um, <laughs> because I don't like gay marriage very much, and I'm trying to wrap my head around the, na the sort of name calling strategy of the left. It's amazing, um, it's good fun. Yeah, I mean you're absolutely right about all of those things, and there's a reason why fast growing economies don't have a huge clamour for gay marriage and all the rest of it because they recognise that traditional heterosexual nuclear family is the engine of the economy and the building blocks of a healthy society. You know, it keeps crime down, it keeps it keeps happiness up, it keeps productivity up. If you're, you know, a right winger and he cares about that sort of stuff, 
that's good stuff. If you're a left wing and you care about people's happiness and flourishing and fulfillment, I mean, I think we all care about all those things, but you know what I mean? If you're coming from an emotional point of view, like the left often does, the best way for people to be happy is to have a mum and dad. You but know? the thing uh, that's crazy is when it comes to climate change, they're all about the numbers, the data, statistics. All mm. of a sudden, they all become meteorologists, mm. which is fine, but which is it? Are you data-based? Because yeah. you're telling me that in, in Greenland, the ice shelf has shrunk 21% since 1978 and that the water's risen in Florida three millimeters in the last 10. Okay, good. I like you like stats. I got some stats about family and the school to prison pipeline and the black community. Would you like to you look at those stats? In. No, I shun those and reject those completely and call about, you a racist. The thing about Why, this is, is that or not? Well, the thing you have to understand about the liberal mind is it is capable of the most extraordinary cognitive dissonance. I mean, for example, they will tell you on the one hand that all gender is socially constructed, that people aren't born girls and born boys. It's the sort of thing that evolves as a result, as a result of you know, societal privilege. And, I have nine-year-old boy-girl twins. So. Right. And, you know, they'll, they'll tell you that... Um, no, you don't know which is which. They'll tell you... <laughs> <laughs> if, you if you're living in Canada, you would be legally forbidden from calling one of them a boy and one of them a girl. Just let them grow up and see what gender they want to be. Right. Um, you know, this is, you know, this is all socially constructed. It, unless you're a tranny and then of course you've got a female brain and, and if you deny that this person is a woman you are a bigot and you should be shunned from public life they're perfectly capable of holding not just contradictory beliefs but contradictory scientific beliefs they're right. perfectly capable of um you know of, of presenting you know studies and numbers and all the stuff that, that that we like um completely contradictorily in different circumstances and not giving a shit about it um so it, you know i mean most of the climate change stuff you know they contradict themselves not, you know most of it doesn't stand up to scrutiny the, the, for the party of science you know, for the side that they like to think of themselves as the side with the numbers and with the science. Well, that's what um, I'm saying. They have like, so little respect for the scientific method. Well, it's extraordinary. You know, what I here's what I like to try to tell uh, whenever I talk to Ed Bagley Jr. I said, look, I I replaced all my l conventional light bulbs with LED light bulbs because it's cheaper for me. Yeah. And I'm motivated to do it. They last longer. They, I get a smaller electric bill. Win, 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 and and you get uh, slightly less greenhouse gases or whatever it is. So, I, you know, whether th we're creating climate change or not is not really to me. It's not really the argument. It's if we are, then let's build nuclear power plants because that'll save a lot more than coal burning plants would do. No, we're against that. So which is it once again? Can we right. look at the statistics? Can we crunch some numbers? Can we simply ask smart people? What is the cleanest form of energy? They will tell you it is nuclear now. All right. Look, can we use that? Absolutely not. Okay. But so more guys just die in a coal mine. Is that okay? Well, no. Well, then what do we use? I don't know. I'll tell you what I don't want. And that's, it's, yeah, that's and it, the it's answer. It's interesting how they started this fight, too, on the climate change thing. They went in hysterically, apocalyptically, on emotion-based stuff. Like, we are terrible people. We're raping the natural world. We're destroying the world around us. It's all our fault. Man-made climate change. And they upgraded it to climate chaos. And, you know, these... these she was, and it was only really when they realized that they had to be evidence-based, they started winning people over. They were saying, well... Well, there's that whole other thing, like, you know, there just won't be any of this stuff left, and we need energy security. And then normal people are like, oh... Oh, actually, I would like cheaper bills, and it would be good if we did have power in fifty years. And okay, fine, we'll do it that way. They don't, they don't seem to understand that you know the, <laughs> most people want to know about numbers and data and evidence. And instead, it was this sort of apocalyptic, you know, guilt shaming. I mean, all this stuff comes from the middle class, right? The, uh, what you would call the upper middle class is the root of all evil. That's where feminism comes from. Um, this is where you know this sort of um, uh, in this, this this middle class white guilt that gives rise to most of you know the liberal nonsense. Um, and they, they just seem to hate themselves and everybody else. And I, I get the impression they just wish that they wish that people weren't on this planet. I mean, you look, at the, you look at the president. Obama obviously doesn't like the country very much. You look at liberals. They don't like people very much. I mean, they just seem like well, it's just sort of a political movement born out of the most abject self-loathing. Yet they have the gall to call me a self-loathing homosexual because I like to you know make an interesting argument about whether gay marriage is a good thing or whatever. You know, they'll, they'll pathologize you whilst having their entire worldview ultimately born out of self-loathing. The uh, we got the Huff. Thing. I want to say this real quick, like, 
Um, you know you've arrived as a country when you hate yourself. <laughs> you mean you're out of problems. We, yeah. we were talking about the Filipinos. You turn that laser inward. inward. Yeah. Filipinos yeah. love themselves some Filipinos. I mean, Manny Pacquiao's punch drunk and president. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Like, they love it. And the, when Manny Pacquiao fights, the whole city shuts down. And by the way, that's 4 a.m. On a, on a Sunday or whatever, because with the time difference mm -hmm. and whatever it is. But... Uh, oh, I said country, city. Yeah, we screwed up. Anyway, um, Philippine. So the Philippines love the Philippines. We were just talking about this with Max Pata. You marry a Filipino, do a Filipino profession. Don't embarrass your father with the blah blah blah. <laughs> with the guitar playing, with the, the guitar music. playing, and this that, and the other. <laughs> this country's officially out of problems, so we have plenty of energy to turn on ourselves, mm -hmm. which I believe we're doing. Right now, we you, yes. look when you're build when you're trying to conquer nature and build cabins in the woods and stuff. You don't turn. No. You don't have energy. We got a lot of extra energy. Yep. I want to. I'll play this HuffPo thing, and I want to know if if you think Mother England has the oh, same gosh. energy to hate themselves or more. That's the reason I left. Uh, all right, all ahead. right. Let's uh, let's <laughs> let's li listen to the nice lady argue with me over two simple concepts. <laughs> Talking about, I have. You know. So what was it that you and um, that you and Gavin Newsom were talking about? I mean, you were talking about poverty, right? Um, G Gavin Newsom went on this jag where he said half the Hispanic and African American people living in Los Angeles don't have access to an ATM or checking accounts. And I said, why not? And he said, well, what do you mean, why not? Or something. And I said, what's the problem? And he said, oh, it's a you know multitude of problems. And I said, well, what are they? And he started off on this jag about check cashing places preying upon blacks and Hispanics. And I said, who else are they preying upon? And he said, everybody. And I said, then why did you just single out blacks and Hispanics? And he said, because they're preying upon them. He did a bullshit, um, cowardly politician talk in a circle, n provide no answers just make these broad sweeping proclamations that black people and Hispanic people couldn't get checking accounts. And my question to him is, was and still is, why not? Well, what's going on? I mean, if a Hispanic person walks into a bank, they're going to be turned away or what's going on? And then you're a politician. What are we what are we doing here to try so he to didn't give you a good answer as to perhaps what he thought maybe some of the systemic causes are that it's zero it's zero know, leave minority groups in, uh, you know, in, in positions where they are more likely to live in poverty. And I, basically, and I, no, I gave him the answer, which is family and education. And we can all get out of this mess. And he said it was much more complicated than that. But then, that is a little more complicated than that than just saying family and education. Not, not much. <laughs> oh, but come on. I mean, it's, it's a system, on. right, where if it's you – It is much harder it's to get system. out of a certain income. It's a system. Yes, we have a system in place that holds down blacks and Hispanics but doesn't hold down Indians and Asians. That's our system. Remember at the meeting? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, let, her, let her go. she got another 25 <laughs> seconds here. But she, here she is arguing with me. It's much more complicated than that. But then, that is a little more complicated than that than just saying family and education. Not, not much. <laughs> oh, but come on. I mean, it's, it's a system, right, where if you – it is much harder to get out of a certain income bracket if you're born into it. If you live in a certain neighborhood, right. that that's, affects the that's quality. That's why you have to focus on family and education. But I mean, I'm not, not gonna, Christian or anything. You're not going to solve everything. It would solve everything, yeah. Just family and education? What about, uh, you know, the, the drug war that we have that's failing? What I about think, the, the school educated, prison pipeline? Things well, like this. The school, the prison pipeline, if you focused on education, I think would interrupt the school, the prison pipeline. Well, the problem is that Unless schools, are, well, yeah, schools are maybe not focusing on education so much as they are on reprimanding right. children. There she is. She's shopping to post. That's the talking. There's the talking oh. points. There's your talking. Full chocolate. Who had answers? Who had more answers? Her or Gavin Newsom? It was a dead heat. A dead heat of, of, of a big fat fucking still, zero of answers. It's Not very like he wanted to talk about slavery. It's very strange. Gavin Newsom's going to be, we're going to get him or Via Retardo as the next governor of California, everyone. <laughs> Enjoy your lives. I'll be with my family getting educated. So, Sorry. No, no. The, the weird thing about this is, you know, if there is, for instance, a 
patriarchal conspiracy to keep women down. It's not doing a very good job. No. Um, women, are, women are now going to university more than men. Ugh. There's a male suicide epidemic. According to many figures, women now get pay. If you believe there's a pay gap, um, you know, the, if, if anything, the numbers are reversed and women are getting more money under mm. 30. It, you know, if you under go, 30. If you go to, yeah, but this, this is going up all the time. If you, um, you know, if you th- 97% of workplace fatalities are male. Uh, more Ooh. women go to college. Women get better jobs. They uh, live get, get longer. Better, they live, well, men pay way more into the tax system and take mm-hmm. way less out because of, not just because of pregnancy because women get sick more and live longer if there is a patriarchal conspiracy to keep women down you it is doing girl. a really really bad job and the same holds true of all of these other leftist conspiracy theories look at the numbers it's not true all right i'm 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 not as far and uh we'll do a little news uh first uh war- give me a warm-up would you sweet chicks <laughs> <laughs> I like to cut his chin. <laughs> Can I ask a quick question, Milo? Uh, yes. So I'm wondering, you do these tours, a lot of them are protested, sometimes they're shut down. Mm-hmm. Um, two parts. A, are there kids that actually show up and want to be there and, and are, are excited that you're there because we only see the ones that aren't? And mm-hmm. and B, have you has anyone ever come up to you and you've changed their mind or are they just sitting with their uh, arms crossed? Well, the second, I mean, liberals are fame whores. They're star fuckers. So even the feminists who are disagreeing with the audience come up for photographs and signatures and, and, and autographs afterwards. So, I mean, how much, you know, and, and if they even show up to the real talk at all, because, you know, it's raining outside and why can't I just do it on Facebook? Lazy and disreputable people. Um, if you were to come to the talks, you would discover that this crazy social justice instinct in um, universities, which is telling white people that there is something wrong with them because they're white, men that there is something wrong with them because they're men, almost sort of elevating homosexuality to to a sort of, um, or anything that isn't straight, to a sort of morally superior um, environment. It's it's very weird the left doesn't see the irony of um, ridiculing and discriminating against people on the basis of skin colour, sex sex and sexuality, but apparently they don't. Um, You discover actually at my talks... my talks sort of bring the internet to life. You know, I have a very large uh, fan base of, of very uh, excitable and wonderful smart people who are grateful that somebody is finally talking to the under, you know, 40s or whatever. Um, and actually at my talks, you sort of get an internet comment section come to life. So you'll get somebody chanting, chanting Black Lives Matter and smearing blood over their faces. But then the frat boys will start, che- uh, will start chanting, Trump, 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 <laughs> just as a sort of tribal <laughs> rejoinder. Um, what my experience so far has been that the... Crazy social justice loons are a very small minority. Most people just want to be nice and want to be educated about this stuff and are being told lies by their professors and being told lies by the media and being told lies by the student unions. And they believe this stuff about campus rape culture, the wage gap, because they've got no reason not to. But when you go and you give this talk, I just see like jaws dropping and eyes widening right all the way through the room. And, and there's a queue of, of – I mean, I, I rarely talk to, to – audiences of less than 500 these days and there's a queue of 350 of them waiting for autographs and pictures and that's, that's almost unprecedented on campuses it's in, it, you know outside of like proper celebrity you know like rock stars and Milo things. I have a theory that uh, flies in the face of what you just said which is I don't you're be- allowed to be wrong that's okay I don't believe that they do believe I really don't like when they say there's a rape culture that's on mm. campuses, mm. why are they shipping their kids off to college well, in record numbers? They're female I'm, no, daughters. I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the kids. The students do believe this. You know, when, a, when oh, the students at, believe it at Rutgers, so three weeks, no, two weeks after I was there, they held a group therapy session. Um, no, this, this, this is true. They had a group therapy session, which involved the the police, members of the campus authorities, student leaders, professors, um, to help the the students that were so traumatized by my presence on campus. Students who hadn't even been to the talk, who were just so uh, traumatized by my presence on campus, by the existence of a gay man with the wrong opinions, um, that they they needed therapy. They needed to be um, they needed to be yeah. coaxed, to, to be coaxed. now look. I believe that these students are sincerely traumatized, which is why in the last couple of talks, I haven't gone quite as hard on the poor kids. The problem is the faculty. The problem is university administrators. They are not teaching kids properly. And in many cases, in these liberal arts colleges, these small places like Bucknell, you know, in Pennsylvania, the professors don't just not teach the fact-based, libertarian, conservative, uh, alternative points of view to Marx. I mean, Marx, of course, being the number one economics textbook in the country by, you know, by a huge margin. Um, Yeah, um, they don't just not teach the alternatives. 
they don't even know them. Uh, and it's so endemic is this far left progressivism in the education system in this country that they're churning out students who are dumber than when they went in. I, you know, the gender well, studies graduates are less able to have a healthy, successful, well-adjusted life and less ready for the workforce than when they started at college. And that's the, my experience. You know, the problem is not the students, the poor kids who yes. in many the, cases well, do you're, feel You're uh, 19, feel your brain's mush. The, I, problem is the, the problem is the faculty and the administrators. And, and a lot out of the, like I, what I was saying in the hypocritical department, every left leaning celebrity in this town is, they've got two issues. They've got the rape culture on the campus and they've got the rising sea levels. They're sending their kids <laughs> off to college and moving to Malibu. So if you're really worried about the rising sea this levels is, and the rape the culture, why are, you go, why are you living in Malibu? This is the thing. When conservatives say they're worried, when, when Obama comes out and says yet another thing that makes Second Amendment kind of people worried, they go out and buy guns. They put their money where their mouth is. Every time, I mean, Obama doesn't like the first or the Second Amendments very much, but he particularly doesn't like the second. And every time he says something about guns or tries to push something through an, an you know, executive order or whatever, sales of guns go up because we put our money where our mouth is. Liberals, on the other hand, who have run these institutions for decades, are now expecting us to believe that these um, far-left liberal institutions are hotbeds of rape and racism. Well, if they are, you did it, mate, and you're still sending your kids there. That's the, I, that's the part that's always insane to me. Like, you <laughs> guys, it's, insane. it's the most liberal place on the planet, and it's, a, it's, <laughs> it's, a it's basically... It's a rape cellar that you guys have been running for 40 years? But what's so funny is when they turn it on each other. Find like, a mirror. They pay for the privilege to go to. Right. Yeah. But it's funny. There was like a, uh, there was a, a, a gender pay gap scandal at Gawker a while ago because some woman, has, you know, some of these idiot bloggers has been sort of, you know, indoctrinated into believing that there's some kind of wage gap problem at Gawker. She does the same kind of babyish numbers that the, the regular guys do to come up with, you know, the, the pay gap. I can see her walking in. Bad time to ask for a raise. <laughs> yeah. Back, Very bad time to Bad. Ask for a raise. <laughs> <laughs> All raises have been temporarily suspended. <laughs> but it's you know it's great because they start turning on each other and now this happened at Gawker. I mean you know the wage gap stuff is nonsense. Most of your listeners will know this, right? If you take the total amount of money earned by women and the total amount of earning, un- money earned by men, you do a simple division. Well, that's earnings, not wages. You know, women don't get paid less for the same work. That's because there are all sorts of reasons why women don't work as hard. Sorry, sorry about it. You know, as a, as a gender, I have two jobs. As a gender, <laughs> not you, love. Thanks. Outlier. Not you, that's love. What I'm saying. Because, no, because she does this and she makes your sandwiches. I get it. Uh, but. <laughs> <laughs> women, on, in general, don't work as hard. They work shorter hours. They take longer holidays, irrespective of children. Now, I'm a nice person. You know, like, I don't mind subsidizing, you know, um, pre- pregnancy, even though I'm gay. Like, in the tax system, I don't mind paying more in and getting less out because it's babies. It's important, right? We've got to perpetuate the species. But if you lie to women about this stuff, you know, they get very angry about it. And um, anyway... Do you know what I want to know? I want to know where the, the gay straight, when the gay straight pay gap is going to be fixed. Because the way that they do the numbers with men and women is they just take all the money earned by straight people, or all the money earned by women, and all the money earned by men, and they just divide it. Well, I want to take all the money earned by straight people and all the money earned by gay people and divide it. And you're going to find there's a pay gap of like, I'm like, I'm like, 97% pay gap or something. When are they going to fix it? You see, it's babyish economics when you, I, t- when you put anything else in, the, in that bucket. I agree. But I, the good thing is they're turning on each other now. Gawker's has this scandal. You know, um, the, what was it? Is it the, was it the Obama White House? There was some, there was some Washington Post headlines about this. You know, Obama White House is sort of like terrible pay inequality. Why? Because the women don't work. <laughs> they don't, they don't work. have time to worry about that right now. They have to come up with $115 million for Hulk Hogan. All Isn't right, it let great? Me, uh, make Isn't us, it great? Let, let me, who are you for? Who are you voting for? Daddy, for sure. Trump, Trump, I call Trump Daddy. Yeah. Oh, is is um, is and we're, we're quickly back to uh, England for a second. Yeah, we are out of problems here, as I always say. So we hate ourselves. Agreed. That's what we do. We're yes. we're basically like a teenager who has I have lots of problems. I still hate. Myself. They have <laughs> nothing. We have nothing to do and nothing. And eventually, they just start cutting. On their thigh, we just start. Mm-hmm. We're, we, that's what we do. We don't have any predators, any mm-hmm. enemies, any any. There's no wars. There's no. I mean, real anything that we fear. No, it's essential threats. So yeah, we start overdoing it with hand sanitizer, and if someone invents something called veggie wash, and my wife goes out and buys it because we don't have 
problems. Mm -hmm. But in the UK, you guys are sort of out of problems. Well, we were. Well, you were. Well, we but were. are you guys cutting on yourselves like we are, which is constantly beating yourself up? I like your analysis. It's a sort of return of emo. Um, I mean, those of us who grew up in the 90s, we had Kurt Cobain and mm -hmm. Marilyn Manson and Brett Easton Ellis. We kind of knew what pain was. The millennial generation, at least, is what I like to call the first entirely middle class generation. They've never really known trauma. They've never really known any pain. They've never really wanted for anything. Um, but the slightly older generation, the sort of 30, those bitter 35 year olds that work at BuzzFeed, you know, who mm -hmm. are just obsessed with the world being terrible, um, who have everything they could ever want. Um, I think your analysis is correct um, where they're concerned. In America, certainly, there isn't too much to complain about, the, you know, well, there wasn't until Obama came in. Um, in the UK, we have pr a problem. Um, and in Europe, more generally, we have a problem, and that is this sort of um, influx of, of radical Islam. And um, the immigration stuff in Germany is horrifying. But it's but Europe, uh, but uh, the UK hasn't escaped from this. We've got um, fourteen hundred girls who were you know sexually assaulted and gang raped in Rotherham uh, by Pakistani rape gangs. Well, it's like going to not, one of our universities. Which was not so, well, you would believe that, wouldn't you? Yeah, no. Well, I mean, yeah. there are real rape cultures. They're in the Middle East. They're anywhere you find Islam. And um, Ivy League. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know a guy from Pakistan, and I didn't see him rape anyone <laughs> while I was talking to him. So, so you can't wrong. be real. It you're can't wrong. Be real. Well, this is just, you know this is and this is precisely the kind of argument that is used to excuse this stuff. And it's why for ten years, you know, girls were being targeted, racially targeted. They were going for white girls because they were considered less. Well, than, there was whole know? neighborhoods so, you couldn't walk through that's, and that's, nobody said anything that's, that's, in that's, the middle that's, of France. That's I perfectly mean, true. And they still are. And they're getting worse. And Germany is now, I mean, Germany as a country is, is screwed. Well, Germany, I'll it's tell you done. what's going on with Germany. Germany exterminated a bunch of Jews and gypsies and homosexuals and retarded people 65 or 75 years ago, and they're overcompensating now, That's which true. is going to cause them problems in the future. That's but true, but they're I importing the one group of people that hates Jews even more than the Germans did. Oh, I never thought I mean, about it's it like, that It's way. like Merkel is sort of accidentally welcoming in a second Holocaust. Well, there I is... I mean, these places, you know, you don't read this in the German press, but there are these places in France, um, you know, bagel stores, and the, the, the bagel oh, store on. bit of it never makes it into the news report. It's like, mm. oh, they just totally at random chose this synagogue. They totally at random chose this bagel store. And they, 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 the media won't report on that. They won't well, tell you, you what was actually I, blown up. I don't get... I, I, you know, I'm not... Uh, I'm not an Obama basher, per se. I disagree with a lot of his stuff, but I understand his appeal in many ways. All right. But <laughs> when he go. won't call Fort Hood a... He calls that a workplace killing, or we will not say Islamic terror or something. We'll not even use the words. You yeah. know, he says things like unfortunate mm -hmm. incident and yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> At that point, it becomes a little comical, right? Yeah. Like... But people know this now. They're waking up to this stuff. They realize when Paris happened, it took um, some British TV networks. And you know, I, on Sky News very often, love Sky News, love many of those people on there. I did a Trumpism then, didn't I? Mm -hmm. uh, They're all fantastic. And, you know, I love these people. To They're, love these people. They're great. Terrific. I love them. We have many great relationships. But it took them a day and a half to say the word Muslim or Islamic or terror. It was just tragedy in Paris. It's not a tragedy. It's not a tragedy. Some guy walked in, went, oh, what, what, and blew people up, you know? I know. I mean, like, that's, that's, that sounds <laughs> unproximate. <laughs> yes. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know. So. Yeah, I, I... No, I nailed it. That was good. That was pretty good, yeah. <laughs> I don't... You hear me do the Star Spangled Banner. Um, I yeah, don't it, get it either. I, I don't... Well, it's, it, the reason is that um, the, the left has constructed this um, pyramid of victimhood. Yes. Um, white gay men like me don't score very highly anymore, which is why the Daily Beast is like telling us that our dating preferences are racist, that we still have white privilege. And you go up the, you go up the, the ladder and the very, very top, above, even above trannies who are, you know, completely untouchable, perfect, beautiful angels from heaven who can never put a foot wrong. Um, above trannies, You've got Muslims. Why? Because Muslims agree with the left that the West is bad. Uh, and all the things that um, radical Islam likes, feminists like too. If you look at what they want, they want women to cover up. They want less speech. They want all this stuff. You know, feminism and radical Islam aren't that different. Um, they look very similar if you, if you actually put them side by side. What this, what, how they want society to look. Segregated, this, that, and the other. You know, you've got, you've got this crazy Jeremy Corbyn, the left-wing guy who's you know, leading the Labour Party in, in the UK who suggested segregated train carriages. Well, where have I seen that before? You know, th this huh? is the thing. I mean, um, For whom? For men and women. For men oh. and women. Segregated train carriages for men and women. Now, of course, the left will say it's to protect women from sexual violence. You know, Islam will say it's to, you know, well, 
sort of admit that it's because men can't control themselves. Both of those things are sexist. Um, but the end result of this is the same. I say this to Black, Black Lives Matter protesters in college. I say, you know what, guys? You're coming in here stoking racial hatred. I'm sorry to say it, like the KKK. You're coming in here asking for segregated dorms. You want blacks-only dorms. Well, guess who else might have quite liked that? The KKK. You're coming in, and, and you know, you run through the list of how society would look if these guys got their way, and it ain't that different. Um, and you look at the radical feminist um, progressive politics in America, what they actually want society to look like. I know it sounds stupid, but you actually, what, what they want society to look like doesn't look that different from, you know, from many of the things that, that, um, that Muslims want. And, of course, all of the criticisms that uh, rad- radical Muslims and even, frankly, you know, mainstream Muslim society. I mean, we're not talking about extremists here. I could be killed for being gay in 11 countries. That's not ISIS. That's mainstream Muslim well, society, right? The- but the... But if you if you you know if you look at the criticisms of the West that Muslims in the Middle East make, well, progressives agree with them all. Yeah, I, I look. My problem. I have the same sort of stance that Bill Maher has here, which is everyone always goes, well, there's just a tiny, tiny, tiny little minority of folks that are carrying out these atrocities. And yes, that's true. And then there's a much larger group of people that are watching it go down Don't and not anything. really where, judging or doing anything about the, where's it. Where's the worldwide Muslim peace movement? Because, well, there's a, because there's, there are Christian ones, there are Buddhist ones, there are Sikh uh, peace organizations, there are African peace movements that want to bring that, you know, to, to fix this and that constant. There are Indian ones, there are Chinese ones, there are peace movements everywhere in the world. Where's the Muslim peace movement? Well, that's what I'm saying. It's like we have the clan, but the clan is frowned upon. No, it's, it's, an yeah. it's an shunned. irrelevance. You're shunned. They're irrelevant and they're it's shunned. An like everyone goes, oh, don't be naive. Okay, you tell me the last time some clan atrocity mm. based atrocity happened i name mean name a I, single white supremacist columnist in a national newspaper or a white supremacist presenter on television because yes, i can show you some black supremacist ones right name a, the last time that a white supremacist went anywhere close to saying white people are better and didn't have their life destroyed that's all we don't point. tolerate we it. shun it mm. we shun it and despite it, the fact that we built everything you know we did i mean there, there are perfect there are perfectly valid reasons to be quite proud of what the of, of what this particular race has accomplished if you take the view that yeah. it, the skin. I, I don't. Right like, idol Milo saying, right? No, yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> I, know, I don't really care that much because I prefer to interrogate no, people on the basis I, of what's in their character. I do scream but if you take that view, I'm with you. No, if no. you take that view, then there is an objectively better race. I scream at people all the time when they're like, <laughs> I know, white, heterosexual, white males are, are the enemy. But we got the Golden Gate Bridge out of them, didn't we? At least yeah. the like, internet, we got to space, <laughs> you know. We got a few global, perks. The global financial system. We've got, I mean, you know, we've raised continents that are not white out of poverty thanks to globalization and the and the, and the free market economy we're you know lifting india out of poverty you know we've enabled all of china's progress we ain't that fucking bad thank you podcast the milo and now i'm gonna spell this out for you y i a double n o p o u l o s show the new podcast that's on uh Oh, you listen to it on the Podcast One app. Love that. Yes, that's part of joining the family. And go on the li- go online and uh, check him out online and find out where he's going to be in speaking tour near you. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much, Milo. Thanks for having me. And, and Joe Coy as well. Coy Pond. Check that out. So until next time, it's Adam for Gina and Milo and Bald saying Mahalo. I am the feminist who is out to ruin your life. I am the feminist who is ruining your perfectly respectful marriage by suggesting Audrey Lord to the book club that your wife attends. And yes, I am the one who convinced her to get that shorter haircut that you pretend to like but don't really like. I am the feminist who is pushing your daughter down the slippery slope of sluthood by giving her a high five when she says she keeps her own supply of condoms. And incidentally, I've tried to turn her by sexy gay by re- recommending some dental dams. Yes, I am that hysterical feminist who demands trigger warnings on scenes of rape and violent sexual conduct. Yes, I am that militant, man-hating ball buster who insists on opening the door for you just because I made physical contact with it first. I am that ice queen cunt who responds to your street side compliment with her most frigid 
I didn't need your comment. I am out to infringe upon your rights and freedoms and extra room on the subway bestowed upon you for having a penis. I am absolutely a threat to your way of life. Woo!